these off. Yeah, there it is. And there, and there it is on your tie as well. Let me show. Yeah. You. Today we're going to talk about neon. We haven't made a video about neon for a long time, and I always thought it was a bit boring, but we've had much more fun with it than I expected. We even managed to sneak in a couple of explosions. Though, of course, neon itself doesn't explode. But you'll hear about that in a minute. Neon is the second of the so-called noble gases or inert gases just below helium in the periodic table. It was discovered in 1898 by Sir William Ramsey and his colleague Maurice Travers who actually died the year I started studying chemistry, 1961. But I never met him, sadly. They were distilling air, liquefying it, and then distilling off the components, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, eventually. And for some reason, they managed to separate neon in that way. The reason why I say for some reason is because neon actually has a much lower boiling point than argon and nitrogen, but somehow it was trapped in the liquids. Neon, I didn't realise this, is the fifth most abundant element in the universe, far more abundant than some of the elements that we think are quite common. But it's fairly rare on the, our planet, on the planet Earth, and it's only found in the atmosphere, so the only way you can get neon is by liquefying air and separating the small amount of neon that is there. But neon, being near the top of the periodic table, is lighter than air. The reason for this is although the atom of neon is heavier than, say, oxygen or nitrogen, Oxygen and nitrogen are O2 and N2, whereas neon has just one atom in the molecule. Therefore, Neil and I thought, perhaps if we fill the balloon with neon, it might float. And miraculously, Neil had hidden away a whole cylinder of neon, a really big one. So it was quite easy to blow up a balloon. Here we go. Neon balloon. Now he's got to get it down. Where did this cylinder of neon come from? Like, it looked pretty old to me. The cylinder of neon belonged to one of our colleagues who is now retired who was using it for some laser experiment. Brady thought that perhaps if breathing helium makes your voice squeaky, that perhaps breathing neon would have the same effect. I tried breathing neon, but I didn't take a big enough breath. Hello, hello. So my voice stayed much the same. But Brady, being braver and younger, took a deep breath of neon and his voice came out somewhat higher than it is normally. Hello, 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 hello. I don't think you're breathing it in enough, Martin. But not as high as if he'd taken a breath of helium. Yeah, yep. that definitely is affecting my voice. Yeah. But it demonstrates the fact that if you have gases of low molecular weight, the speed of sound is faster, so when you speak, the sound is a higher frequency, higher pitch. I have inhaled neon, and this is the result. <laughs> As you know that Neil and I like exploding hydrogen balloons. <laughs> and given the fact that neon in an electric discharge gives off red light. We wondered just perhaps if we put neon and hydrogen together in a balloon and set it off, 
we might get a rather redder colour. So being good scientists, we did a control experiment just setting off the hydrogen balloon and it went with a satisfying whoosh. And then Neil put his match on the stick to a mixture of neon and hydrogen. We tried different amounts of neon and hydrogen. We began with what Neil claimed was a 50-50 mixture and then went to 70 or 80 percent neon with the remainder being hydrogen. Brady has put pure hydrogen and neon side by side so you can judge for yourself if you can see any difference. I think that the fact that you don't see any difference, or at least that I don't, is scientifically a rather good demonstration because the colour of neon is due to excitation of electrons within the atom and that requires a lot of energy. So what this explosion is demonstrating that with thermal energy, heat energy, it is very difficult to excite the electrons in an atom. Whereas if you're using an electric discharge, you can do it quite easily. And of course, Neil wanted to do an electric discharge. You're all familiar with shop signs and advertising signs that contain neon gas. And we even have our own little neon sign in the shape of a star. And when you put high voltage through this, you get very intense red light. So, neon, argon, argon, helium. But Neil has quite an old piece of equipment called the Tesla coil, which produces a very high voltage in a probe which the handle is insulated and you mustn't touch the, the end. And he used this to touch against a glass vessel containing a low pressure of neon gas. Yes, no. yes. We had quite fun moving the high voltage probe around a glass vessel containing neon at low pressure. And also the tu glass tubing at the side, which was used to fill the flask. So what is happening there is that the high voltage is exciting the electrons, which takes in energy. And when the electrons fall back to their original level, they emit light. And in this case, the light is a reddish colour. It looks redder in our star than in the vessel, partly I think because of the way that the room is lit and also because the discharge was rather more diffuse than in the star. And the red colour is, if you like, a telltale signature of neon because each atom has the electron energy levels a slightly different separation and it just happens in neon that it gives out red light. And you will see on our other videos that with argon and krypton you get different colours because the energy levels are different. And Brady even filmed through a spectroscope that splits up the light to its different wavelengths and you can see these strong red lines coming out of the neon. Can I put my hand in front of it? Yeah. Right. That's a single from the laser. Neon 
has three different isotopes, but one of them is in very small quantities. Neon 20, which has relative atomic mass of 20, Neon 21, where there's very little, and Neon 22, which is nearly 10% in natural neon. In the early days of studying gases and ions, neon was the first element where it was demonstrated that you could get different isotopes. Those are atoms of different weight, but of exactly the same element. Nowadays, we know about isotopes of all the elements, but this is a historic role for neon because it was the first where this was demonstrated. They're all stable, so they're not radioactive, and they are, as far as I know, there's no particular use of one neon isotope rather than another. You may have noticed behind me this strange thing, which is actually upside down, and it was a key piece of equipment in my doctorate. The reason why it was so important is that I used it for freezing noble gases, including neon. To freeze neon, you need a temperature below 10 Kelvin, 10 degrees absolute. And this machine could go down when you had a lot of money to actually run it under those conditions, could go down to four degrees absolute. Professor, why did you need a lot of money? Like, do you mean like electricity or...? You needed money because you used a lot of helium gas. And in those days, and still now, helium is quite expensive. And you might get through 300 cubic feet of helium in an afternoon. And you also had to get rid of quite a lot of hydrogen. So there were banks of cylinders in the lab. So let me just show you what it looks like. So this is the bit gets cold. And in my experiments, there was a um, window holder screwed into there, which was where we froze the neon. But this was at the bottom, this was inverted. So it's upside down. Yeah. And it was surrounded by a vacuum jacket to stop air and water condensing. Just inside here, there is a nozzle through which helium gas at high pressure was expanded so that it liquefied to make a small amount of liquid helium. But if you expand helium at room temperature, it doesn't liquefy. So there's an intermediate stage where you liquefied hydrogen and that liquid hydrogen cooled the apparatus down so that the helium would liquefy. And upside down, inside, if I lift it up, there's a big hole where my fingers are. And in there you poured liquid nitrogen to cool down the hydrogen. So you really had to look after this machine to keep it cold. And the experiments would often go on from nine in the morning till one o'clock the next morning. But I managed to make some really unstable molecules here. So I'm very affectionate about it. I haven't used this since 1972, but it still sits in the corner of my office because I feel proud of it. Is it common for professors to have pieces of equipment that have become redundant, but they keep them for sentimental reasons? I don't know. Well. You always say that I'm like a squirrel and I keep far too many things. So I think some people keep equipment, probably not as big as this for most of them. I don't know where I possibly got that idea from, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of things in the Prof's office, why not join our periodic table of Patreon supporters? Here are our neon people, but you can join up on any element. There's hydrogen, helium, all the way through, all the classics, all the greatest hits. All the way up to Ogonesson if you choose. 
not only helping us make more videos and appearing on this table, we also share occasional bonus pictures, extra videos, bits and pieces, just to show our Patreon supporters we appreciate them.